section 6.4, proportional reasoning. Um, we know that a ratio is the comparison between two quantities and that we can write that as a fraction. We can write that um, in another form of a fraction. So those two things are the same. We can write a proportion, I'm sorry, a ratio using a colon, um, or we can write it with words. It's just comparing two quantities, like the quantities A and the quantity Bs. And we say that we compare them uh, sometimes as a whole to a part, or a part to whole. Either way. For example, I make hummingbird food. And the recipe for that is four parts water, one part sugar. Notice I'm not saying cups, I'm not saying tablespoons, gallons, I'm not giving you any units here. I'm saying that these are equal parts and you just need to match them up. So if you wanted to make a small batch, we could use tablespoons. of water, and we could use one tablespoon of sugar. And you might think that's way too small, but actually when you're doing hummingbird rescue, you, you need small batches because you're feeding one bird at a time and they're baby birds and they don't eat that much. But maybe you have lots of wild hummingbirds and you want a large batch. I would maybe use four cups of water and one cup of sugar. Ooh, but maybe you don't have that many, so you want a medium batch. You could do two cups of water and a half cup of sugar. Whoops, my P turned into a Q. So this ratio, four to one, water to sugar, it tells you how many parts of the water and how many parts of the sugar can make up the entire whole. Proportions are basically equations that uh, use our ratios. I realized I wrote ration instead of ratio up there. So a proportion is a statement that two given ratios are equal. For example, the hummingbird food, I could say one tablespoon of sugar to four tablespoons of water, that is equal to the same proportions as one cup sugar and four cups water. And we could argue that tablespoon divided by tablespoon, cup divided by cup, you just get one to four, it's the same ratio. Now, because we can make these proportions, these statements that two ratios are equal, we can create proportional equations that allow us to solve for an unknown. For example, if I know that I need one uh, part sugar for every four parts of water, and maybe I want to use, maybe I, I look in the cupboard and I have exactly one-third cup sugar. I might want to know how much water do I need to keep this ratio correct. And this section, we're discussing how to solve an equation like this, how to find that missing number, how much water would we need. Theorem 6-20 in this section uh, starts by saying A, B, C, D. They're each rational numbers, so they could be completely different numbers, uh, but they're all rational. And we need to make sure that we're going to pick B so that it's non-zero and D also needs to be non-zero. Then we can write the proportion A over B is equal to C over D if and only if the product A times D is equal to B times C. And let me show you why that's the case. You've probably seen something like this before and you've called it cross multiplying. 
where you said take the denominator and multiply it across the equal sign so that you get a times d and then do that in the opposite direction so that you get b times c. And that's kind of what is going on here, but technically cross multiplying is not a mathematical term, but I'm going to show you where it comes from. The equation a over b equals c over d, we can manipulate this by multiplying through by the denominators, but not just to one half of the equation. I'm going to multiply every term by the denominator b. When I do that, we'll see that the denominator divides off on the left, but it stays here on the right. And we'll do the same thing with the denominator d. I'm going to multiply the entire equation by d. We'll see that d divides off on the right-hand side, but it sticks behind on the left. And so on the left, we, are le uh, we do have a times d left over, and on the right, we do have b times c left over. So this idea of cross multiplying actually comes from multiplying through by the LCD. So we can check to see if a proportion is true just by doing this cross multiply or multiplying through by the common denominator of the equation. Now this is useful because it's going to allow us to solve unknown proportions. For example, the one cup sugar to four parts water. We said we had one third cup sugar and we didn't know how much water we need. Well, we can multiply through um, to create the statement four times one third is equal to one times the unknown amount of water. From this, we can multiply on the left to get four thirds and find out that we have our unknown quantity is equal to four thirds. So we need four thirds cups of water if we have one third cup sugar. Mix that together and we'll have a perfect batch of hummingbird food. Next, we'll talk about constant of proportionality. So sometimes we'll say that one quantity is proportional to another. And what that means is that maybe we're looking at y and x. They're not equal to each other. They're different numbers, like maybe 10 and 5. We would agree 10 and 5 are not equal. However, we could make them equal just by multiplying through by a constant, like 2. If we multiply the 5 by 2, then these are equal. That's our constant of proportionality. So maybe y is not equal to x, but maybe there's this perfect constant that would make them equal to each other um, if we multiplied one of our terms by that. Now try this. Exercise 6 uh, has us solve a problem from the student grade book or student uh, workbook. It says, Seven hours to mow four lawns. We want to know how many lawns could be mowed in 35 hours. So we can realize that there's a proportionality going on here. So seven hours we're able to mow a total of four lawns. So I'm going to create a proportion here. Hours to lawns. So seven hours, four lawns. And we want to create an equal proportion, but this time using 35 hours. And we don't know how many lawns can be done there. So we set up our proportion and then we can solve it. So essentially it looks like we're cross multiplying. Instead of putting a question mark here, I'm gonna let x represent that unknown value so that we can create an equation that says seven x equals four times 35. And then if I divide through by seven on both sides, I can solve for x. 
Um, instead of multiplying 4 times 35, then dividing by 7, I'm going to simplify first because I know that 7 is actually, I'm sorry, 35 is 5 times 7. So the 7s divide off, leaving behind just 4 times 5, which is 20. So in 35 hours, we'd be able to mow 20 lawns. Example 27, we're also using some kind of proportions here. So Kai, Paulus, and Judy made a total of $2,520. I'm going to abbreviate their names. So K for Kai, P for Paulus, J for Judy. Altogether, they made a total of $2,520 for painting a house, but they didn't all work the same amount. So Kai worked 30 hours, Paulus worked 50, Judy worked 60. Go Judy. They did divide the number, the money, by uh, the amount of hours worked, and they all got paid the same rate. So if we wanted to figure out how much to pay each person, what we would do is first come up with an expression that shows the amount each person deserves. So, for example, Kai, who worked 30 hours, should be paid X amount for her hourly rate. So let's let X represent the hourly wage. So Kai should be paid 30 times X because Kai worked 30 hours. Paulus should be paid 50 times X, and then Judy should be paid 60 times X. And if we add all of their pay together, we should get the total that they got paid, 2,520. When we add the coefficients, we have 30 plus 50 plus 60, we get 140 total hours put into this job. And then we divide off the 140 so that we can isolate the X, and we find that the hourly wage is $18. So each person is making $18 per hour. Now we can go back and figure out how much each person actually should get paid. So Kai should get paid 30 times 18, or $540. Paula should get paid 50 times 18, or $900. And then Judy should get 60 times 18, or $1,080. And we could double check our work and um, add these up to make sure that it gets 2,520 back. Example 29, the last example for this section, for this chapter even. So we're at a party and there are five men for every two women. Now we don't know how many people are at this party, but we can tell that the pairing off breaks down to this ratio. But then all of a sudden, 14 women show up. After that happens, the ratio becomes four men for every three women. We wanna know how many people are at the party. Specifically, how many men, how many women? We can make a connection between how the men units are changing. Notice that the number of men at the party never changed. So from these two ratios, we know that the five units of men so five units, these are the old units, have to be equal to the four units, the new. So when we say five units, we're not talking about five men. We're talking about 
five groups of men. So maybe a unit is like three or four men. So the five times the original units is, has to be equal to five times the new units. And then we can make a connection between the women units as well. So the two women units plus 14 actual women has to be equal to the three new women units. Now, the old units, they didn't care if we were talking about men or women. Old units represented a certain number of people in a unit. So we can combine these together like they're like terms. So in the men's group, we had five of the old units and two of the old units for women plus 14. So it's like five old units plus another two old units plus 14 women. Another word, seven old units plus 14 women. And that has to be equal to the new units as well. So in our new units, we have originally, um, let's see, four new units of men plus three units of women for a total of seven new units. And these have to be equal. So seven of the old units plus 14 women has to be equal to the seven new units but the only thing that's different is what constitute a unit. So we set this up here and we try to solve for the units. So now we have this equation, seven old units plus 14 women is equivalent to seven new units. Notice that everything in here has a factor of seven, so we can actually reduce this to seven old, Sorry, instead of seven, I'm gonna write one old plus two women would be equal to one new unit. And that means we can scale this up however we want. And I'm gonna scale it up so that we have four new units. That way I can replace it with five of the old units. So I'm gonna multiply this whole equation by four so that I get four old plus eight women equals four new. And then the four new I can replace with the five old units. So four old units plus eight women is equal to five old because I can combine the old units, they're the same type of grouping, I can subtract four from both sides, and I can see eight women make up one old unit. Now, an old unit doesn't have to be men or women, but we can now see that the old units had 80. So one old unit was 80 people. So if we wanted to look at the original proportion, we had five men for every two women. And that meant five times eight, or 40 men. And then two would be two times eight, which would give us 16 women. But then those 14 women showed up. So instead of 56 total guests, we had 14 more, which put us at 70 total guests. And if we wanted to, we could separate those men and women. We could have 40 men and 16 plus 14 or 30 women.